All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, provider roundtable meeting for July of 2023. Um, my name is Amy Braswell. I'm a community resource consultant, and I support Region 2 on the provider team, and I'm the provider team lead. Uh, we have a full agenda for you today. You can see the agenda on the screen. Um, we're going to start today actually with Nathan Hobble, who's going to give us an update on the 22nd study period on behavioral services. And then after he's done, and um, hopefully Heather Norton will have time to join us to give us our uh, DOJ update. Uh, and then we have Mackenzie Glasgow, um, our Associate Director of Quality and Compliance for the Office of Licensing, who has an update for us. And I apologize, I had misspelled Mackenzie's last name in the agenda that was sent out. Um, her last name is spelled G-L-A-S-S-C-O. So I'm sorry about that, Mackenzie. Um, after Mackenzie, uh, Heather Hines, our IFSP program manager, is going to uh, give us an update on the IFSP program. Um, and then after that, we have um, uh, Catherine Rice giving us an update from the Office of the Inter Office of Integrated Health Network Supports. <laughs> I put that wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, going to give us an update from their office. Uh, after that, I'm going to go over a few ISP misunderstandings and give you some tips regarding the ISPs. Um, afterwards, we have Zachary Bird from Principal Behavioral Consultants, um, who's going to give us a, um, a presentation regarding uh, superva uh, sorry, supervision and staff support uh, and talk to us a little bit about um, competencies. Then we have some important uh, updates to review and then we'll have some Q&A regarding the departmental updates that we sent out um, last week. Um, and without further ado, then we're going to allow Nathan to go ahead and give us some updates on behavioral consultation services. Hey, good morning, everybody. Nathan Hobble here, project manager for the division here at DBHDS and also the agency's lead for these services. So I'll keep it brief and I'm not going to read it to you word for word, but just wanted to highlight some of the findings from the 22nd study period on behavioral services. All of the compliance indicators that we had met related to behavioral service services previously remained met, and we also came in compliance with two. One of them is related to provider growth and uh, completing a gap analysis. That's um, compliance indicator 7.14. And um, the second one that was met for the first time is 7.20, which is a quite comprehensive compliance indicator, but part of it is related to quality reviews and uh, evaluation of on-site visit tools that support coordinators are doing. So you can see here some of the highlights and I'll just try to break it down pretty quickly. There was a qualitative review for 100 people where the DOJ consultants reviewed programming that we had also reviewed um, just from a, a pretty basic lens for this indicator 7.19 to determine if some minimum expectations were in place for functional behavior assessments and behavior support plans. And you can see some of the quotes here that, that they noted that I just wanted to put forward. Um, I, I would imagine that it, it's pretty challenging to read a four to 500 page report. So I wanted to highlight a couple of the key areas here as well. That report is public and you can go check it out on your own at this point on the DBHCS website. If you navigate to developmental services, you'll be able to find it there. And there was also a second review that was more in depth where uh, a team of behavior analysts that work under the purview of, of the independent reviewer uh, cross reviewed 25 sets of behavioral programming and used the tool that we created to determine adherence to the practice guidelines that we call the behavior support plan adherence review instrument. And we, uh, we have this acronym called the BASPARI or that some folks might be familiar with. And um, they're, they essentially did line by line evaluations of these plans and then compared and did an inner score agreement to our BASPARIs and had 60 to 90% agreement overall. So we were pretty pleased with that. And you can go ahead and you can read that as well and, and look at Dr. Hike's evaluation of the reviews that we're doing. Uh, but I just, I bring it up because I think it's important to highlight that we haven't met some of these areas. We are making great progress and it's not just the work that EBHDS is doing. That's a very small part of it. It's really the work that the providers are doing and the collaboration that we've had with providers over the past several years since we've made changes to these services. 
can go to the next slide. Hold on. Locked up on me. There you go. No problem. And wanted to provide a graphical display about one of the compliance indicators that was not met. That's that's very important, not in the quality bucket, but more in the getting people connected in a timely manner bucket. So this compliance indicator 7.18 um, essentially is outlining an expectation that individuals are connected to this service within 30 days of the need being identified at their ISP meeting. Um, and our, our baseline was that 0% were connected. It was a small baseline. It was around 15 people a couple of years ago. There's been dramatic improvement in our ability um, and support coordinators ability, better said, to connect people to the service when they need it. So what this is displaying is uh, just three dimensions here. The orange line is the number of people that were connected within 30 days. The blue is the number of people that were not connected. And that corresponds to the vertical axis on the left-hand side of the graph. And then the gray line is the overall percentage. And that corresponds to the vertical axis that's on the right-hand side of the graph. And the most recent data um, is hovering still around 70 to 73%. And March, 2023, we were, um, we were at 73% when we did that data review. So not meeting the 86% benchmark, which is quite lofty um, to meet, but definitely moving in the right direction. And just a note that the expert reviewers indicated that you can see here this quote that I'll kind of paraphrase is, there's an increase in, in people that need this service getting connected to it, which is a very positive thing. Next slide, please. And last but not least, I, I'm going to pop this information into the chat, but there's a search engine that uh, is an initiative that's related directly back to the data that uh, was just displayed where a support coordinator or a family member or an individual can go onto the DBHDS website and search for providers based off of the region that they're in, um, if, they, if they provide telehealth, languages spoken, the pedigree of the professional that's delivering the, the service. There's many different ways that you can kind of slice and dice on that search engine. So that's available. We're making an update to it uh, right now to be able to filter down to in-person, face-to-face by CSB, so that will be forthcoming. And we also have a website that has a lot of information in addition to the search engine. There are resources on there, uh, links to professional literature that's open access, training videos, and then there's a section down at the bottom of that website about that talks about all of the quality assurance initiatives that uh, we've undertaken here at DBHDS over the past uh, two to three years. So I'll just close by saying thank you. I'll pop that information in the chat here in a second. And if anybody has any questions, they can reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat as well. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Um, and the other important information, I have some screenshots of how to navigate to find that search as well. So we'll we'll show you all a little bit of that too a little bit later. Thanks again. Thanks, um, Amy. Let's see. Is Heather able to join us? Not yet. All right, well then um, I guess we will move on to Mackenzie. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, good morning and you know, thanks for inviting me today. I'm here to provide you all with a few reminders from the Office of Licensing. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with renewals. Um, so providers must submit their renewal application prior to the expiration date of the license. Um, Connect does send a provider a renewal reminder um, 90 days prior to the expiration of the license. Uh, remember that a renewal application and proof of SCC must be submitted through Connect prior to the expiration of the license. And for the SCC document to be accepted with your application, the SCC registration should be in an active status on the website. Additionally, the name on the license and the name of the organization on the SCC website should match. Um, if the license is not active or the name does not match, then the renewal will not be processed and your license may be at risk for closure. All right, we're going to move on to cap extensions. Um, so once a licensing report is issued, providers must submit their corrective action plan to the department within 15 business days. 
One extension may be granted when it's requested prior to the due date. Um, if you would like to request an extension, um, you're required to submit that request via Connect. Um, per the regulation, extensions cannot exceed 10 additional business days. So here's a screenshot that shows you what it looks like in Connect and within the red box. You can see the request extension link. Um, CAP extensions will not be approved for licensing reports that include health and safety violations. All right, well, we're going to move on. Thanks, Barry. All right, let's talk a little bit about some recent trainings. Um, so I do want to remind everyone that we have been providing um, some trainings. These trainings have been geared towards um, initial applicants as well as new and experienced licensed providers. So in April, um, the Office of Licensing and the Office of Clinical Quality Management offered the Minimizing Risk Training se Sessions. Um, they focused on the 160 and 520 regulations. Um, the tools, templates, um, PowerPoints, as well as the reported webinars are now available on our website for you to access. Um, those are located under the risk management section. Um, additionally, on June 26, we held an initial applicant orientation webinar for those that are interested in becoming a DBHDS licensed provider. Um, both the reported webinar and PowerPoint are available on the website. So if you know anyone who is interested in becoming a licensed provider, please feel free to refer them to that information. Uh, last week, we just concluded our licensed provider coaching seminar. This was a three-part series that was held on June 30th, July 7th, and July 14th. Um, those webinars and PowerPoint presentations will be available to you on the website within the next few weeks. Um, we do wanna thank you all for attending those trainings and we, we do hope you found um, we, we hope you found that information helpful. So thank you. All right, we'll move, move on. Uh, now, based on some of the feedback that you all have provided us during trainings, we have uploaded some additional root cause analysis samples. Um, these samples are specific to residential and day support services with a focus on identifying the root cause related to medication errors. So you can access these from our website. Um, under the root cause analysis section. Okay, so lastly, I would talk, I would like to um, talk a little bit about sponsored residential services to provide some clarification. So I do want to remind everyone, if you are interested in adding any of the sponsored residential services, this includes DD sponsored residential services for children and adolescents, you are required to comply with the general regulations which are the rules and regulations for licensing providers by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. This is 12 VAC 35-105 and not the standards for regulations um, for regulation of children's residential facilities, which is 12 VAC 35-46. So I just wanted to provide that clarification because um, there have been some questions as to which regulations the um, sponsored residential for children and adolescents falls under. Um, so I hope that provides some clarification for everyone. Um, that is all that I have for you all today, and I appreciate the time. All right, thanks so much. Okay, um, next we have yeah. up Heather. Oh, sorry. Up Heather, I was just saying, still moving on. All right, Heather Hines, you are next. Okay, thank you. I'm Heather Hines, uh, the program manager for the Individual and Family Support Program. And I'm here to share some reminders about a program, as well as some information about the upcoming uh, IFSP funding cycle. Next slide. Uh, and again, some of this is going to be reminders, and some of you may have heard this before, but they're really important resources. So we want to just make sure at least once a year we join you all to keep you informed about what's out there available for individuals and their families. Um, so our target population is primarily those on the wait list for the DD waiver, but as you'll see, some of our programs are available to anyone regardless of their waiver status. Next slide. We have four main components and I'll get into a little bit more about each one of those, but we have a funding program, partnerships for peer and family mentoring. Uh, we partner with Senior Navigator for the My Life, My Community website. 
and as well, and also we have a community coordination program where, with our state council and our communications going out to individuals and families. Next slide. Our uh, IFSP funding program um, this year, these are some um, mainly reminders about it, but um, eligibility information is on this slide. It's an annual program, um, and this talks about who's eligible. Um, we have this year approximately 2.5 million to provide to individuals uh, on the wait list. 50% goes to individuals with priority one status and the other 50% to those with a priority two or three status. And the guidelines have not changed from the program that we ran in, Feb in January and February. So if you're um, familiar with how that worked, um, nothing has changed from that as far as the guidelines and the funding and the priorities. So uh, just as a reminder, for priority one, funds are awarded based on critical need summary scores until the funds are expended. And then for priority two and three, uh, those individuals will receive half of the funding and that will be um, randomization to determine who receives the funds. Um, one thing to note is that uh, if individuals are asking, you know, should I apply or not, anyone can apply, um, but we are gonna prioritize those in priority two and three who did not receive funding last, last time. So everyone can apply, but uh, if you received funding in January, February, then you would be moved down to the bottom of the list and those who didn't receive funding uh, would, would be prioritized. So that's just a, a thing that we're doing each year to make sure the most amount of people get an opportunity for funding. Um, and then next slide. So this year we, we learned a lot. Um, this is the first year that we had it in WAMS. And we, we learned a lot from talking to you all, from talking to individuals and families and our partners. And so we made a lot of enhancements. They're actually in process of, of being um, changes being made for the application process. But um, some things that we wanted to make sure that you all knew. So when you're talking to individuals and family members as they're applying and asking about the program, you have all the information you need. Um, the key, one of the key things is to make sure that people's information is correct in WAMS because the application does pull information from their profile, um, such as their social security number, date of birth, and last name. So in order to log in, they, there's a, that information needs to be correct in WAMS. So since our program this year is going to probably be in October, we don't have an exact date yet, but if all goes well with our changes in WAMS, then uh, late to mid, mid to late October is when we hope to open up for applications. Um, that's not official, but that's just what we're hoping for. Um, but that gives you a couple of months to, to go in and take a look at folks on the wait list and, and see if you can update their information, make sure it's accurate. That'll just cut down on the challenges people have logging in. Um, the email address in WAMS is the one that is pulled for the IFSP funding application. And that's what we will be communicating with them um, on using. So again, check that email address to make sure that that's correct. Um, they can, when they, when they apply and that, that email address is pulled into the application, um, they are able to change it in the application, but it doesn't do anything in WAMS, of course. Um, but it's it's really helpful if it's if, if you have a chance to check it ahead of time. Um, the the good news, and I know last year or last round in January and February, it was really frustrating for everyone and a challenge because we were required to spread out the application start dates. So if you were party one, you could apply on one day, and if you were party two or three, you had to wait a few days to apply, and that caused a lot of frustration, I'm sure. Um, for you all, um, CSBs were inundated with calls when applicants didn't know what their priority number was. So um, we were able to solve for that this year and everyone will be able to apply at the same time. So you won't have hundreds of people calling and asking what their priority number is this year. Um, and then um, I already mentioned that the funding guidelines will not change and then we'll be posting lots of information um, in our monthly digest, um, and our, our annual notification that's going out, that announcement will be in there and on My Life, My Community. Um, so thank you for everything you all did, helping everybody 
apply last year and um, we're excited about this year going smooth more smoothly for everyone. Um, next slide. And just some uh, reporting information from the January, February cycle. Uh, we did have 4,914 applications for funding and we were able to approve 3,770. Uh, and you can see the amounts there and the age, the ages, obviously, well, that was interesting that there were individuals under 18 who were, um, who applied, there was 3,174 and uh, adults over 18, there's only 1,740. So lots of families applying for this funding. Next slide. Okay, uh, moving on, I just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of our councils. We have the state council, that's our advisory board, and um, we have regional councils. They were on hold um, for a year or two there, and then we were able to recruit and, um, and appoint members to our five regional councils uh, this spring. So that's been very exciting. Uh, we've got some a great group of people in each region. Um, and we had our first regional coordinated council meeting in July. This was open to the public and featured a presentation by Renita Clemens from DBHDS. Um, and the topic was what happens when I get a DD waiver? And this was a topic that was requested by our council members uh, made up of individuals and family members uh, we wanted to also take a moment to thank a lot of the CSB supervisors who joined us. Um, they came and provided uh, information during uh, breakout sessions um, with our council members and attendees. And that was CSB supervisors from Loudoun County, Chesterfield, Henrico, Region 10, Rappahannock Area CSB, Hampton New, Port News CSB, Highland CSB. Um, I think that's everyone, but we just wanted to thank you for taking the time to do that and answering questions. We wanted to give a perspective from DBHDS and also um, from CSB staff and supervisors um, so that families and individuals, you know, had, had an idea of how this, how it should go when they get a waiver and, and what to what to expect and, and how to navigate that process. So we feel like that was a really um, successful event. We had a, a, a good showing, people um, turned up and got some good reviews in our in our survey afterwards. So thanks for everybody who helped with that. And uh, keep an eye out for information as we have our regional events. Uh, those are things that are free and available and there we do those um, events for the individuals and families to, to educate them about information that's important to them. So please keep an eye out for those uh, announcements and share widely. And next slide. And next slide. And then quickly, this is just a reminder about peer mentoring. Uh, you all know about that, but I just wanted to highlight that Nat, um, Natasha Cooper from the Ark of Virginia has stated that she would come to any CSB and do a presentation about uh, peer mentoring. So please reach out to her if you're interested in that. Um, it's it's a uh, underused resource uh, that we really um, hope more people will take advantage of. Uh, we've heard from mentees that it really helps them to gain those skills that they're looking for. Um, and mentors, uh, you know, find it to be a wonderful opportunity uh, to, to share their knowledge. So uh, just a reminder about that. And remember that, you know, when you're doing your VIC, um, that that's something that we really need you to educate people about and remind them that that's a resource available to them. Next slide. Same for family mentoring. Again, another free resource to anyone, regardless of their waiver status. And uh, we encourage you to inform individuals and family members about this resource. Um, there's nothing, nothing better than being able to talk to another family member when you're trying to navigate the system. Um, so this, this is one that really takes the pressure off of support coordinators um, because you don't have to be the support person for the family, there is a resource out there for that. So if someone's got a lot of needs and their family member, you don't have to be that person. You can you can link them to this resource and there's someone there that can help them. Uh, next slide. 
Um, this is just a reminder about the My Life, My Community website and the uh, the, the phone number. So there's the uh, toll-free number. Um, and I don't think it's pretty small there, but it's 844-603-9248. And sometimes people have a hard time using a website. So that call center is available. Again, another resource for individuals and families when they're trying to find a resource, they don't know where to go, don't know what to do. Call that number. Those folks are amazing and they can help them find what they need. Next slide. And another resource for families and individuals is our Facebook pages. Some people really like to connect with other families through uh, social media. And so now that we have our regional councils up and going again, uh, this is another way that people can connect. Uh, they can uh, use these Facebook pages to meet other families and hear what's, what's happening. Um, so those are gonna start being more active very soon. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, and then our first steps document. Uh, this is a document that um, goes out to everyone on the wait list uh, once a year um, as part of our annual mailer campaign. It's gonna be going out in August, but we also know that a lot of people may not, may not look at their mail, they may not look at their email. And so this is a resource that we really rely on CSBs to tell people about. Um, I think in the, in the actual um, performance contract, it states that CSB staff are to notify um, anyone coming to the CSB to, um, to access DD services are to be given a resource guide. And that's what this is. So give this to everyone when they come through the door, whether it's electronically or print, if you print, print some out, um, and they can really have that as their companion as they try to figure out like where to go for information. Um, it is really um, developed in plain language um, so that people can, can understand it and it's, and it's clear and, and it's just a lot of different links to a lot of different resources. Um, so please share that with individuals and families during the intake process or whether they're on the wait list or waiver recipients, really it's for anyone. Um, and you can also walk them through signing up for our uh, our listserv, our email list, and they can get electronic mailings as well. Um, next slide. So just finally, these are just a reminder that every everything is open to everyone except for our funding program. Even our peer mentoring program is, is open to people on the wait list. Um, and so that's just all of the, these things are things that are free to individuals and their families, um, and hopefully we'll take some of the pressure off of you all and be a resource to you as well. Next slide. And that's it, thanks so much. All right, thank you, Heather. Um, now, uh, Heather Norton was able to pop in and join us for our DOJ update. So thank you, Heather, for making time to come in and join us. Thank you. Like I'm, I Heather already did IFSP. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I didn't have any slides for you, but you have a nice, beautiful slide with your name on it. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Thank you so much. So, um, if you are not aware, uh, we will be going to court tomorrow at one p.m. Uh, the judge has asked us at that time. We will be discussing um, indicators that both parties have agreed to uh, remove as well as indicators for potential revision and then uh, this concept of core indicators that will exist post settlement agreement and so what we have been focused on is really identifying those things that are specific to a good functioning developmental services system um, post the settlement agreement Right now, the settlement agreement is supposed to end December of 2023. We should know tomorrow what um, the judge thinks in terms of the possibilities of that occurring and or um, what other expectations he may have for us after that time. So um, this is like a day early um, in terms of having some clear uh, 
answers for you in terms of what the next steps are related to the settlement agreement. But hopefully we'll have that information uh, before the end of this week. If you're in Richmond and want to join us at the courthouse um, on Broad Street, uh, it is open to the public. And uh, we'll start at one o'clock. And so if you're going to join, I recommend that you get there at least by noon. Um, so, you know, with that, that's my, that's my in, a mini update. We are currently in compliance with 238 out of 317 of the indicators and 80 out of 120 uh, provisions. So about 75% uh, complete with all of the elements of the settlement agreement as it's written today. And so with that, I am going to pause, Amy, see if there are any questions that will be put in the chat. And if not, I am going to hop off and go to another meeting. There is one question in here that asks if there's space for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it says, is there space or support group for providers to network and share resource, resources with each other? I'm assuming that this is related to showing up at the courthouse because it popped up while you were talking. <laughs> so um, is if Samantha, who asked that question, if you can verify in the chat if that's what this is related to. Is there a space for people to meet there at the courthouse? I must, I may be reading into that incorrectly. <laughs> I'm just gonna be patient because I need additional information. And if it is a broader uh, question about do we have a location where we can share information or connect providers who are working on best practices and different things like that? Um, we don't currently, but I really do like that idea in terms of creating a, a workspace where people can share things with one another um, and make that available to each other. Yeah. Heather, that's one of the things that the SIRW is working on also, because how to network and share resources. See, I knew it was a really good idea. <laughs> yeah, there's no additional information coming up. So, uh, and I know you have to run, but thank you for coming in and giving us this information um, and hope we're looking forward to an update. Okay, it says not related to the courtroom. It's a broader question. So, all right. So thank you for that idea though, Samantha. <laughs> we'll, we, we can talk more about that. Um, but thanks again, Heather. And we're looking forward to see what happens tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Bye. -bye. All right. Uh, Catherine Rice or Kay, um, you are up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Kay Rice. I'm an RN Care Consultant at the Office of Integrated Health and Health Support Networks. And today we wanted to introduce you all to the annual healthcare visits toolkit that has recently been created. You can go to the next slide. Um, so the purpose of this toolkit is um, to act in, as an advocacy tool that will help to improve health outcomes of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it's shown and proved that improved health outcomes can really um, equal to improved quality of life for individuals with DD. And so this toolkit can be used um, either before, or during, or after appointments with primary care providers or specialists or any type of visits. Um, and it really allows caregivers to be able to organize and track the individual's um, medical information and um, have, you know, better visits. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so it can be used again in the pre-planning stage um, to help the caregivers to plan and gather information that can then allow for the appointments to have improved communication, less stress. Um, caregivers can more efficiently advocate for individuals during the visit if they have all their information prepared and can also increase the productivity of visits. <clears throat> it includes lots of health literacy documents um, that are aimed at improving caregiver knowledge, and those can include um, a list of medical abbreviations or common labs, so caregivers are more familiar with what those are and what they mean. Um, and then it also has post-visit documents that are also in, um, aimed at improved follow-through to make sure that they receive all of the visits and tests that they need, which then can in turn improve outcomes as well. So next slide. And so determining 
which documents in the toolkit you can use. There are many, many documents and um, they are really kind of a pick and choose what works best for you type of um, documents. They'll vary slightly from each individual to the next because no you know, two people are the same. Um, there are some documents that are for children and some for adults <clears throat> and the toolkit documents um, for each individual really should be person centered um, and tailored with the content to meet their needs, you know, related to their age um, or their medical needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can go to the next one. So this is an example of the um, contents list. So it gives you an overview of everything that's included in the toolkit. And then each section you can kind of click into to see what the documents are. Um, and the next sections, we'll just talk a little bit about each one of them. And go ahead. <clears throat> so those first three um, um, sections at the top are immunization schedules and they are clickable. So you can click them and then they can be downloaded from the CDC website. And they are um, the first ones for the children ages zero to six and then children seven to 18, and then the adult schedule, so for 19 and up. Um, and it will list all of the immunizations that are recommended for each of those age groups. <clears throat> Next slide. And then the first section is, um, it's titled W1, which is the pre-annual visit checklist. Um, so this just allows a checklist for caregivers to prepare and streamline streamline um, for the annual visit. It helps make sure that they write all of their questions and concerns down, and then they can address those through during the visit with the primary care provider and whomever it may be. Next slide. And then um, again, there is a common healthcare abbreviation um, list, a common lab test list so that um, caregivers can understand what abbreviations are that are used often, or maybe what labs are ordered and what they're ordered for. It also includes a BMI chart, so you can, um, you know, see what a person's BMI is, and that can help um, understand information better related to health and exercise and healthy eating. Um, so the next slide. Um, this section includes documents from um, our My Care Passport that was um, introduced, actually, I believe, last year. Um, and so the passport itself is a communication tool for caregivers and individuals that allows you to fill out um, lots of information about the individual that it's important to know for medical caregivers. Um, and then the next three documents are tip sheets that were created to go along with that. Um, one talks about consent to help healthcare providers who can make decisions for individuals if they're not able to do that themselves. Um, a Medicaid waiver tip sheet just to help medical providers understand what the waiver is and what that means to individuals. And then also a discharge tip sheet that really outlines what is needed when individuals are discharged back to their home or wherever it is maybe they, they may live um, and what are what's needed in relation to prescriptions and orders and things of that nature. And then the next slide is that post checklist that we talked about. So it's a checklist to be used after the visit um, and it will help to streamline follow-up, you know, to make sure they get all of their visits that they may need, any kind of test. Um, you know, it's just a checklist to keep track of all that and make sure it's all done as it's supposed to be. And then the next slide. So just related to future documents, um, the toolkit is actually already posted to the DBHDS website, so you can go there to view it. got posted before we were able to meet today, um, and it looks just like it does on that content slide, so all the sections are outlined, and you can um, click them, and then there will be a training um, that will be announced soon about how to kind of utilize the toolkit in more detail. Um, and then there will be documents that will be added as the toolkit is developed and grows. There will be gender specific documents. Um, and then the documents will have, you know, descriptions under each one to help you determine which is best for the individual you're working with. And then there are plans for future toolkits to include a dental visit toolkit, a behavioral health consult toolkit, physical therapy and occupational therapy, and then durable medical equipment toolkits as well. I think that might be the last slide <laughs> about our toolkits. Yeah. Yep. So we hope you can use that and it gives you lots of assistance with your visits and reach out if you have questions. All right. Thank you. Um, there are a few questions in the Q&A um, 
about the target audience and a few things if you could address those. Um, um, yeah, so um, well, if you can address them actually um, directly in, in, in the Q and A, and I, I can sure, uh, address them when we get to the Q and A at the end. And um, Zach, uh, I guess you are next. Hello. We hear you. All right, great. Um, Thank you for uh, allowing me to come and talk today. I'm going to keep it pretty short. I'm aiming for 10 minutes. You can try to hold me to it. Um, this conversation is about um, supervision and, and training. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. Um, a little bit about PBC and myself. You can see me in the top left. Um, and. Um, I'm from Principal Behavior Consultants, and we have a team of behavior analysts who work out of Roanoke, Virginia. Primarily, our job is behavior consultants for uh, either therapeutic consultation through the DD waiver, or um, we work uh, with consultation and training in public schools and in family homes uh, if people are struggling with um, some of the folks that they might live with. Um, and so I just wanted to show you these beautiful faces and uh, and tell you a little bit about that. We'll go to the next slide. This is something uh, that we are interested in a lot related to um, uh, training and related to supervision. Um, we're noticing that a lot of the folks that we work with, um, when we go in to consult with group homes and day support, we're noticing that a lot of the DSPs who have the most experience um, and the most skills and um, those people are promoted very quickly within the agency, uh, usually a year or two. Um, and then the people who have stuck around and really uh, showed um, a lot of potential uh, move up. Next slide. This makes a ton of sense, right? Because these are the people who know the agency best, who uh, are familiar with um, the most stressful situations in the place, and they can sort of deal with those complex situations as they arise. Next. Um, but one thing we're noticing is that not a lot of supervisors have specific training on uh, their job as a supervisor. Um, and so, this is something that we've been thinking a lot about and are interested in. Next. Um, and with our trainings uh, that we've been uh, focusing on, uh, there's this phrase that comes from athletics called, you get what you train for. And it basically means like, if you train to run one mile, you're probably not gonna be able to run a marathon, right? Uh, I know from experience, I, I did my best to train for a half marathon and barely did that. So there we go. If you train to run a long distance, though, you may not be able to run a fast sprint either, right? So it's, you're training for different things. If you train to play golf, you just might not be that good at baseball. Next. Um, and when we think about this related to trainings, that is the trainings we provide our staff, um, oftentimes these trainings only involve lecture-based lessons or they're assessed with multiple choice quizzes um, if we decide that we're gonna use quizzes at all. But the problem with that is that, um, and, and that's actually fine, to be honest, that's actually fine, is specifically if we're looking at knowledge-based things uh, and we want them to have some knowledge and maybe understand a little bit about the concepts that you're trying to teach. That makes a ton of sense. However, we should not expect, um, it might occur, but we should not expect to see generalization to other skills on the job. Um, so uh, we need to develop our trainings to specifically be designed for uh, what we want to see on the job. Um, some examples, I think that are good examples in terms of, um, if you go back a little bit, thank you. Uh, examples that you might uh, notice that are like often, uh, often evidence-based training 
uh, processes are things like CPR. You might have some knowledge-based things that you go and take online or someone gives you a lecture um, about, but then you go and you work on the chest compressions or you go and you uh, work on those rescue breaths because you want someone's body to actually go through the motions of doing that. And that helps it generalize to uh, a situation when it's going to be called for, they can actually do it. Other examples are things like a medication administration. Most trainings for medication administration um, are not just um, things, if you go back, please. Oh, I think it might be on a timer. That's what's happening. Um, if you wouldn't mind going back to the previous slide, I'll try to. Um... Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it might be on like a, a timer. So is there okay. any way to go backwards? Yes. Thank you. And I'm sorry. Um, uh, other things like medication administration. Often we want to um, have people observe people delivering medication and then you observe them and checklist, make sure that they're doing all those things. Uh, also physical management strategies. If anybody is uh, works with um, cases of uh, where you might have to physically restrain someone or um, um, you know, first we want to make sure that people are doing it correctly and they're using de-escalation strategies first, and then they're only uh, using those physical management when necessary. And these are a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of complex skills. And so this is why all of these sort of, or at least the very good ones, are all of these training uh, courses are um, things that you actually have to go and practice. And this is the same with the behavior support plan. Uh, behavior support plan trainings involve um, um, we, we should actually be seeing the staff work uh, with the clients or we should be role playing these scenarios and making sure that we can actually do those skills. Next. Let's see if I can beat the timer on this one. Um, so got some good news and some bad news. Um, the good news is that um, staff behavior can change. So this is a good thing because uh, sometimes we, I think we uh, will sometimes, you know, uh, think like, oh, the staff is not doing what I asked them to do, and they they're not they they're not motivated, and they don't they don't do these things, and I and so it can result in two things. We can either blame the staff because they're not doing the things we'd hoped, or we sometimes blame ourselves. Hey, I must not be a good supervisor, and. Uh, um, so it's my fault and these things. Uh, but the good news is staff behavior can change. The bad news is it really requires specialized trainings. Uh, we have some additional support tools and mentoring things. Uh, uh, you know, and I know that DBHDS focuses on mentoring as a part of these competencies because um, all of their uh, documentation really, uh, with the, especially the competencies and advanced competencies, all these things say the supervisor should be mentoring the person uh, as they're checking off the skills. And another reason I know that they're really interested in um, uh, growth with mentoring is because there's even different levels of skills, right? You can be, it doesn't mean that you're proficient. You might have some competence. Um, and so there's actually, a, 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 so I think that that is the, the idea behind it. Um, next slide, please. I want to share with you some tools that uh, we use performance checklists that in case you're interested in um, working with staff in this way and in, in, in you can add these things to your mentoring um, and your supervision. Um, and I want to share some of these tools with you. Uh, we use performance checklists a lot. That is we break down the steps that a person needs um, in order to actually complete the task and we break it down into small parts. And then we make a little checklist um, and we base it off either we do the task and have someone write it for us, all the little steps, or we watch someone who does it really well and we sort of see what they're doing and we put those down too. Um, we, you know, we don't expect that someone is going to be able to do something without tr the training. Um, it can be a frustrating experience, uh, as we all know. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example of a checklist. Um, this is a giving feedback checklist. So this is sort of like a, a checklist um, for someone who's supervising, someone who's supervising or someone who's delivering feedback. Um, so 
you know, this is a, a list off of um, um, published article um, for uh, feedback. And these are the sort of steps a person might deliver feedback with. And you could observe either, um, you could use it as a checklist for yourself, or you could observe uh, one of your supervisors or staff members who might be delivering feedback. You could work with them on this because this would, um, um, and then we have, next slide, please. We have another one that's receiving feedback. So that, you know, you can think about how actually our staff, um, the way they receive feedback is also very important. Uh, in other words, um, they, you know, on this particular list, uh, we, we actually recommend training staff to um, accept feedback because it's part of their growth and it's the part of uh, a way that they can get better at their job. And it's the way that they can um, also, I suppose, uh, reduce any sort of um, constructive feedback um, or um, those sort of things that are coming along their way. Uh, next slide, please. So these, both of these feedback checklists are going to be available to you at the end for free, of course. And then also we have a, uh, I want to talk a little bit about another checklist, which is um, um, published as well, which is called the performance diagnostic checklist. So sometimes if we're not sure why something is, uh, why staff behavior is not, you know, up to par, it's not doing the thing we're hoping, uh, we can consider the reasons why. So for instance, it might be training, but it might be resources that could be related to time. It could be related to um, resources related to um, other sort of things that they might need to get the job done. It might be their motivation. It could be their abilities. Um, it could be things that are just conflicting outside of work. So these, there's an assessment tool that sort of under, that helps people understand what might be going on in a particular situation. And uh, there's a, I mean, there's a couple, there's many of these, but um, we have one that we're gonna uh, let you guys have for free, which you can probably even search on Google, Performance Diagnostic Checklist Human Services. Uh, it's a version of the checklist for um, our exact field. Um, next, please. It's an assessment tool. I wanna talk a little bit about our courses. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, our courses are for competency, right? So um, we take pride in the, our competency courses. We have the autism and behavioral advanced competencies, and um, and then we have health competencies coming soon, and DSP orientation competencies coming soon as well. Should be out in August. Next slide, please. Um, I want to talk about something we've made for these, and we're going to allow you to have these ones for free too. Next slide. This one is for advanced competency. This is a checklist. It's a competency guide. So you are probably all familiar with um, the competency checklist that we receive from um, DBHDS on uh, all the things that people really should have competencies in if they're working with specific individuals. Um, uh, and I want to show you that we sort of put together this little cheat sheet as a way uh, because we sort of broke it down into areas, uh, descriptions in sort of our everyday terms and sub skills. If you uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so for instance, communication is one of the sub uh, subcategories. And so we've taken all the sub skills, grouped them together and put them in um, uh, an easy, to understand explanation and then how uh, someone could actually show competency using the some strategies. How, what would you have to observe for them to meet that competency? Now, I want to point out just briefly that this is sort of our interpretation of um, what we think would be best practice in these situations. Um, and uh, so it, I think and anybody can do it however they um, would like to as it relates to um, as long as they're meeting the regulations, but this is sort of our understanding of the best way um, that we could think of to do it. Next slide, please. Next. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Um, we also have some supervisor courses. So we've been talking a lot about supervision. And so I wanted to mention to you, we have one specific to the advanced competency DSP supervisors. So that if you think about like basically um, someone needs help navigating the paperwork and sort of um, using these these cheat sheet sorts of things to uh, make sure that their staff are feeling uh, competent and confident when they're on the job. Um, and then we have another one that's really um, that's coming out that's about 
specific to supervisors and supporting their growth, the mentoring section that you might think about. And that one's uh, very interesting. Uh, that one uh, has a remote skill session. So we actually practice some of those skills um, through like a, a Zoom sort of situation. Uh, next slide, please. So if any of those are interesting to you, I wanted to just offer a coupon code. You could just use the coupon roundtable at our uh, website, which is pbctrainings.com. And then if you use this code, this is where you can download the cheat sheets. Um, so there's the cheat sheets, the PDC human services assessment, and then those also those checklists are available there. Um, just put in your, uh, you'll basically uh, put in your information there and uh, you'll be added to our wait list. But then as soon as you, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not our wait list, our uh, mailing list, but then you also have direct access to those materials that um, we shared. Um, thank you. Is there anybody has any questions? Um, let's see if I understand how to use this question and answer thing. <laughs> There are but, questions um, about your uh, contact information, which is up on the screen. Um, but if you could also maybe put it in the chat to everyone so they can yeah, see sure. it pop up um, after we um, change slides mm -hmm. here so they can get it from there, that probably sure. as well. Or you could actually answer it in okay. the Q&A there. You should have access as a panelist. Okay. Uh, contact information, yes. Um, you can you can email me as Zach at principledbehavior.com. I'm putting that in there now. Um, you can go to our website. It's um, if you're interested in the trainings specifically, it's pbctrainings.com. If you're interested in our consultation or um, those sort of uh, services, you can um, find us at principledbehavior.com. I'm going to try to type these in, but I'm not great at multitasking, so. <laughs> Um, and then uh, free, I'm going to put in the free materials at this link here. So did that go through to the right places as far as the chat? Let's see. It went to host and panelists, but um, uh, I can make sure okay, they're copied on. and pasted to everyone. <laughs> I, I kind of had the feeling I was going to mess that up. Okay. Well, yeah, if you we can make sure it gets great. to everyone. Thank you thanks so much, Zach, for everything. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for getting your slides to me so I could plug it into our show. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Uh, very on to the next slide, because I think it's me now. All right. So um, I threw together a few things um, about our uh, ISPs and some cheats and some pro tips uh, to help everybody out here. Um, you can go on to the next slide, Barry, if you don't mind. All right, so first I want to, um, I guess, point everyone's attention to our, um, well, I guess first our offices change. We are now the Office of Provider Network Supports or OPINS, O-P-N-S. Um, and you can um, go to our website. It still uh, redirects if you go to the, if you still have the link to the um, provider development web page, but it's provider network supports now. And if you scroll down on the website, there's uh, this section that says ISP guidance, templates, and training. And there, there's a direct link to the person-centered ISP guidance document. Um, it's the same information from 2018, but it was updated a little bit in 2021. Um, and then there's a link to ISP training resources. There's a link to our current template. Um, we do ask that you get rid of anything prior to the 2022 dated templates because it does not have the sufficient information. Uh, there's instructions for uh, the part five template, um, so you have the right content. It's also helpful for um, if you're doing direct entry um, for complete use in WAMS also. Um, there's uh, the blended part five template. Mm -hmm. If those of you who were on our meeting uh, back in April, Eric had reviewed the blended part five when um, you have um, multiple services, multiple related services, and you're the same provider, how you could do that. And the blended uh, person-centered review template and a sample when you do that. There's a great reference document about um, developing measurable skill building activities. Um, there's a template for your quarterly person-centered reviews. Um, those of you who provide personal assistance, respite, and companion, 
there is a um, document there that shows you how to do modified use of, um, of the part five in WAMS using the DMAS 97AB and the personal preferences tool, including a blank, blank copy of the personal preferences tool and a sample on how to do it. Um, so there's great information right there. So I want you to know that you can go there for this information at any time. A lot of times we get emails asking for this information and you can find it right there on our website. And there's um, a link to that. Um, you can also find the link to it in the agenda that was found out, um, uh, sent out last week. Barry, you can move on. Okay, so to look closer at the ISP training resources document, um, there's a link to the ISP modules in the Commonwealth of Virginia Learning Center. And those of you who had the opportunity to take um, uh, the ISP um, Development Academy training that we've only been able to do a handful of those. Um, this, these are the slide content from that training and their ISP modules now that are in there. Um, the, the actual full training has a, you know, some practice and feedback sessions and things involved in it. But um, this, this is the slide content. So you can go in there and get a uh, kind of a uh, full, you know, A to B soup to nuts training on the ISP. If you just log into the Commonwealth of Virginia Learning Center, you can learn how to start with part one <laughs> and go all the way um, through your part five um, just by looking through those ISP modules. There's also training in there on developing the Part 5 plan for support in Commonwealth of Virginia Learning Center. There's a link to the ISP guidance document. Um, there's a link on how to set up, uh, sign up for person-centered thinking training uh, through the Partnership for People with Disabilities at VCU. There's a link to sign up for the Provider Network Listserv. I saw in our Q&A that there were questions on how to get the alerts for this meeting and other trainings, and that's how you do it through our Provider Network Listserv. Um, and then also contacts on, you know, how to get um, to who your current community resource consultant is. And then there's information on how to access the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia Learning Center because that recently changed as well. So the, um, the most up-to-date way to access the COVLC is on that document. So again, I cannot stress enough to please go and check out our Provider Network Supports website because um, there's great information there. All right, next page. Next slide. Amy, do you, mind, do you mind if I add something? I don't mind at all. Okay, so the ISP Academy or ISP Development Academy, you'll hear it a couple different ways. Uh, one of the unique things about it, Amy was already describing, is you, you do some practical work along with online, and we have a final session. Excuse the noise, I just dropped something. Um, we have a final session that's in person, but everything else is either self-study or virtual. But the other unique part of it, we've done this before in other trainings, but we brought it into this one, is the makeup of the class is sport coordinators and providers. So part of the process is working together as a team, like you would at a planning meeting, but using that time for everybody to know how to address every part of the ISP in order to develop an effective plan that not only addresses all the risk and potential risk, which is a high topic and very important, but also the things that are important to a person that they want to have in their life. So they can have the life that they want. If you have any questions about it, feel free to email me um, and I can answer those questions or you can call me. It's 804-839-0332. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, all 325 people attendees are, are attending are gonna be calling you here soon. <laughs> but um, I would highly recommend um, those modules. All right, um, another place I want to call your attention to is uh, the WAMS splash page. So when you sign into WAMS, there's this you know first page here with the announcements. I'm sure you recognize it with the yellow and everything at the top, but it, at the very bottom, there's this drop down menu that says trainings manual, uh, sorry, training manuals, webinars, and FAQs. And if you uh, click on that little arrow, it'll drop down, and there's a long list full of job aids and user guides and DYKs, standing for did you know documents, on tips and tricks on how to use WAMS. 
And um, there's lots of great information, like how to add a service line, um, how to use reports, how to print, how to where to upload things, where to find things, um, how to add outcomes, how to uh, do all sorts of things in WAMS. So um, if, how to access training for WAMS. This is a very important place to go and look. If you don't know how to do something in WAMS, this is where you'll find it. Um, and so if you don't know, um, sometimes before calling that help desk or calling the, um, uh, you know, anybody else or emailing somebody, you might want to go and look here first. All right, you can go on and move to the next slide, please. Gary, next slide. Did I lose him? Oh, I am host now. <laughs> Uh-oh, we lost Barry. Let me pull up my slides. It is. Let me find the right slide that we were on. All right. Can anyone see my slideshow? Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about adding an outcome. Um, in the part three so um i'm sorry through the part five <laughs> so a lot of people think that once an isp is locked a part three is locked after after you've had your planning meeting and everyone sat down and the support coordinator has done the part three shared plan that there's no way to add new outcomes and uh, whams but that's not true um so people usually think that you need to do an interim plan for supports to do it or you print out a version and you hand correct it and you attach it, but that's not how it's done. It's done through the pro provider's part five plan for supports. And in that section that I showed you um, in WAMS, there's this did you know document and, and it goes through and it walks you to how to add an outcome. And so it's added through the part five of the provider's plan for supports and it'll populate in their own part five and each if, each provider has to add their own outcome. They can do it through there. They can end outcomes through there um, and everything. So that's how it's done. The support coordinator doesn't have control over it after it's locked, but the provider does. And you can find more information on how to do that through that section that I just showed you here uh, in WAMS. All right, I also wanted to go over the requirements for modified use. Um, so for modified use of the Part 5, providers only need to directly enter information into WAMS in areas where there's a red asterisk, and um, then they will upload the remainder of their plan. So the only areas that you need to include um, to directly enter is a backup plan if it's applicable. And then, so if you're doing one of those services that require a backup plan, a box will pop up. Um, to enter that backup plan. But you need to make sure if that's applicable to you that you're entering the actual backup plan. Don't just you know, put notation to see the attached paperwork that shows the backup plan. You should put in there actually you know, who it's gonna be and what's gonna happen. Also, the desired outcome, the end date, a summary of the support activities, whether or not the activity is skill building and the target date by entering by when. And then also um, how to support, which is an, another term for your support instructions, that's not required to be entered for modified use. All right, so that should be uploaded as part of your template that you're using when you're uploading for modified use. All right, also another thing about adding uh, shared outcomes and WAMs. So um, did you all know that the support coordinator is able to add the part three shared outcomes 
before they input the part one, before they input the part two essential information into WAMS. So they can do the part three first, all right? And if they do that, it'll allow the provider to access their share out, shared outcomes and key steps, sorry, I put a misprint in there, um, to start their part five as soon as possible. So um, I do recommend um, that support coordinators do that piece first, and hopefully that will um, prevent some of that tension that kind of happens there as you're getting close to uh, the end date of one plan and the start date of another for authorization. So, um, and I put this little flag in here with a pro tip that if you do have Wi-Fi access at the annual meeting, you can go ahead and enter those shared outcomes um, into WAMS during the meeting because those shared outcomes are what's agreed upon during the meeting. When you are signing that part four, um, you know, your agreements, you know, you are agreeing to those shared outcomes, those key steps that you'll be supporting during the plan. Um, so you want to keep the uh, fidelity of what's been discussed. So the best way to do that is to just enter it right there while you're discussing it. And then you know there's not going to be changes. And sometimes that also causes some tension between support coordinators and providers. So um, you can enter everything that's agreed upon right there, then and there, if you do have that Wi-Fi access at the meeting. All right, um, so I'm gonna move on to some other important updates. Um, and you should have received the full uh, departmental updates with the agenda. Um, and if you have questions about those, you can put them into chat now and you can be read in those. All right, so I mentioned it earlier, please discard any part five templates prior to 4 um, Templates prior to that date do not contain sufficient information. And so they're unacceptable. So we see a lot of people using an old 2015 template. It is 2023 people um, that is way out of date. Um, it does not include it does not include the information that we are looking for in a part five plan for support. All right. Um, the ISP uh, three point. Uh, four went live on May 2nd, and webinars were held in early April. Um, the recording is online on YouTube, on the DBHDS YouTube page. Um, Nathan was talking about the new search feature to find behaviorists on the Developmental Services website. Um, and so there's links to this that were in the agenda. So, and he included it in his discussion earlier. So when you go to that link, if you choose locating providers for therapeutic behavioral consultation, and then mm -hmm. you, there's a link to go to the search engine right there and you click where it says search engine, you can go and access the search engine. Um, also some other reminders for community engagement. Um, that should be delivered in groups of people who have similar interests, um, who prefer to spend time together based on their own individual preferences and not program convenience, all right? Um, another thing that we see a lot is that, um, you know, that the service is being delivered essentially as a group day service, but just in small groups of people where they're just present in the community. And that is not the purpose of the service. The main purpose of the service is to build natural relationships in the community with people who do not have disabilities and are not using services. So just being present in the community in a small ratio does not meet the service definition. So if you have questions about that, please reach out to your provider team CRC because uh, we would love to talk to you about that. Um, it's, it's not about program convenience. It's not just about small groups of people. It's really about groups of people who enjoy being together, um, going out and building natural relationships in the community with people who do, don't have disabilities. It's about community integration. Um, also, uh, this was a reminder Heather wanted me to make sure was in here that it's not acceptable to drop someone in crisis off at a hospital and just leave them there without appropriate supports. Um, it's a serious health and safety issue for uh, the individual and possibly others. Um, and anytime that I've seen this happen, it's resulted in reports to APS licensing and human rights. 
Um, so be very, um, um, yeah, just, it, it's not the right thing to do. Uh, more information, uh, I had spoken about uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia Learning Center earlier. Uh, the requirements for that did change a couple months ago. So if you go to our centralized training page, there are updated um, instructions on how to access, um, access the uh, COVLC if you haven't accessed it for a while. I also wanted to remind everyone to review the list of common QMR citations for providers and support coordinators that are in the agenda that went out and make sure that you're meeting the requirements in your own program so you can avoid your own citations. Um, and also make sure that in your plan, you're uh, addressing the identified health and safety needs from the CIS and the RAT in your ISP in Part 5. Mm. And then an important correction that needs to be made from the agenda that went out in the departmental reviews is that there was a mistake on the date for the targeted end date of the residential reviews for HCBS. Um, the agenda had the date of 8-31-23. It's actually 8-31-25. Um, it's not next month. There's uh, a couple more years. So um, this will allow for 120 days for any provider who does not reach compliance to to appeal having their participation agreement removed and allow for a smooth transition for any impacted individual. So um, yes, that's an important change. It's not uh, ending uh, next month. All right, so that's all we had for our updates, but we have lots of questions in here. Um, Yeah. Will Medicaid pay for hospital stays? Medicaid pays for the individual to have coverage while they're in the hospital, yes. They don't pay for staff to support somebody in the hospital, but you can't just leave somebody there that's abandonment. Um, is there any way we can access these slides? Yes, um, typically we will send them out through our provider listserv and put them up on our provider network, Office of Provider Network Supports website. Um, we have not gotten the last ones up yet. Um, these should hopefully be up soon. Eric um, does review them and he's on vacation, so hopefully we can get the rest of them up there shortly. Um, how does putting outcomes directly in WAMS ahead of time impact plan for transferring from an EHR record over to WAMS? Um, I cannot speak to how your EHR and WAMS, uh, I guess, talk to each other. That would be a question that I think we'll have to get Eric to respond to in our Q&A that we send out afterwards. Um, but I think that they talk to each other, I guess from my understanding of conversations, and I don't know if there's anybody on the call who um, might be able to speak to this on the panel. Um, but I think that they transfer data daily overnight, right? So if you input everything in the part three of your EHR, I would think that that piece would transfer into WAMS in midnight. So um, it wouldn't necessarily be ahead of time. You would just do it at the time of the meeting. But I will get Eric to clarify that answer so we can um, get the correct answer on our Q&A. Can providers also see part two at that time on risks? It's very important too. Thank you for consideration. Yes, part two is very important um, regarding your risks and everything, but you should be talking about all of these pieces. You should be talking about when you're at the planning meeting, you should be having a conversation. Everybody should be coming in with their own contribution through a conversation with the individual about um, their personal profile and how it applies to their service with the individual and each provider 
should be coming in with their perspective and having a discussion at the meeting about the personal profile and that should be compiled and included in the whole shared personal profile. And then you should be discussing the risks and things that need to be addressed as part of your annual meeting as a whole group while you're all meeting together so that can be discussed. So it shouldn't just, you shouldn't just be going on what's in that paperwork, um, but you should be having an open conversation about what needs to be addressed in the annual meeting. You shouldn't, it shouldn't be all about the paperwork. It, you should be having an open, honest discussion about these things in your annual meeting. Of course, there are some sensitive topics that might um, be uncomfortable for the person to speak about with the person there that they might not want you to talk about in front of them. And that's something when you know a person that you know that um, they might not be comfortable with you talking, uh, you know, everybody talking about in front of them. And so you would want to have the permi permission to talk about them separately you know, that's in having respect for the person you're talking about, but it's important that you do have that discussion to address. Um, yeah, uh, so Barry had discussed the development academy and, you know, a lot of that academy talks about having conversations as part of your ISP planning. Um, which is an essential piece of getting that information. And a big piece of that is having a conversation with the individual. Um, if you look at the part one, the personal profile, it's all about what the person wants as part of their meeting, what they want as part <laughs> of, you know, what's comfortable to them. So it's important to honor that as well. I know that that's going in a little deep, but that's really important about being person-centered. Um, let's see. Is there an update from DMAS on the redetermination process? Uh, we don't have anyone from DMAS on the call, but we will capture that question in our Q&A and we will reach out to them um, to include that in our Q&A document. How does that work for CSBs and PCP? Okay, so we will get the uh, question answered about the EHR and WAMS. And, and so there's some questions about a toolkit or guidance on dignity of risk policy. We've had a couple questions about that. Um, that's coming out of the QSRs with HSAG. And so we're trying to find some information about the dignity of risk policy. Um, and we can um, include that in our Q&A. Is there a way we can communicate with BIU requiring uh, regarding hiring new employees, many of the candidates are applying to have barrier offenses that prevent them from working. We're losing money for background checks and trainings only to have to let them go. Um, you do ask, you know, in your application process for them to let you know if they've been committed of, uh, if they've been convicted of a barrier crime. And when they don't, I guess, let you know about that, um, you know, that is kind of an issue, but you, you're you welcome to reach out um, to BIU. There is a link on the website with um, their contact information. You can talk about them, but barrier offenses are in the Virginia code. Um, so there's little that can be done about hiring people with barrier crimes. Let me search. So the QMR is usually presented. Where can you find it? The um, QMR citations are on the agenda. Um, let's see, it's 1125. I can read through them if you like. Um, I'll get to them in a second. What kind of situation would warrant a provider adding an outcome in WAMS? What kind of situation would warrant a provider adding an outcome in WAMS? Also, if something is written incorrectly on a shared outcome, the SC enters, may the provider fix this on WAMS after discussing the error with the SC. All right, so um, before I get to the QMR citations, 
Um, this this is a good question. So someone's asking for an example about adding an outcome in WAMS to the providers part five. So for instance, um, you are you've done the annual planning meeting, right? And you need um, an outcome added for um, say, oh goodness, there's a health and safety thing that was just missed. Um, you know, uh, let's see, someone has a seizure disorder and it just happened to be missed as part of the planning process and you need to make sure that is it's addressed in your part five. So that is something that you would need to go in um, to your part five in WAMS, hit revise, go hit add outcome, and then write a new outcome that would just populate within your own part five to address that. And that's one of those things that every provider would need to add their own outcome in their own part five to address. Um, and if something is written incorrectly on a shared outcome, the SC enters, may the provider fix this on WAMS after discussing the error with the SC. So yeah, I mean, it would depend on what the error is um, as far as fixing with the support coordinator, because if it's a big enough error, you may need to have a team meeting, you, you know, the family, the individual, their support and decision maker, their substitute decision maker, you know, may need to be involved in that. Um, so if you have a specific situation, um, you may need to reach out to the support coordinator, the um, their supervisor or your community resource consultant to figure out how to do it, depending on what the issue is. Um, let's see. Would you need key steps for the outcome you add? Yes, every outcome. Um, if you take the training, you'll the outcome is more than the outcome statement. The outcome is the outcome statement, the key steps and services, and the target date. Um, okay, so I said I was going to review the the QMR citations. Let me see if I can pull this up and then share what I have here for you all. I'll make it a little bit bigger and then I'll share my screen. So I will tell you when I share this that we tend to see the exact same things every time. All right, so these are the updates that were in our agenda, if you can see this. So QMR citations for a provider, missing background checks, missing criminal history checks, missing LEIE checks, which are the list of excluded individuals and entities, um, missing orientation and competencies, missing documentation of staff supervision, risks not being addressed in the part five, part five is not being signed, vague support instructions. And so what's meant by vague support instructions is you're saying DSP will do this, DSP will do that, DSP mm -hmm. will do that, um, and not saying how, like moving on from saying, okay, DSP will do this, but not saying DSP will support Amy with brushing her teeth by handing her her toothbrush. Okay. Or, um, DSP hands Amy her toothbrush. Amy will turn on her own water. Um, DSP needs to put the toothbrush, uh, the toothpaste on the toothbrush for Amy. Amy will brush her own teeth independently. Um, DSP needs to fill the cup with warm water for Amy because Amy prefers warm water. Um, to rinse her teeth, uh, rinse the toothpaste out of her mouth because she has sensitive teeth, those types of things. You need a lot more detail so every DSP can provide consistent supports to Amy. Um, daily notes lacking required information, um, quality person centered reviews not completed or completed late, or no documentation that it was sent to the support coordinator timely. Um, QMR citations for support coordinators, missing background checks, missing LEIE checks, the RAT is either missing or incomplete, 
Items marked in the RAT are not noted in the RAT summary. All risks not being addressed in the ISP. Quarterly person centered reviews not completed um, and VIDES not completed on time or not completed face to face. A few other ones here. Thank you for replying to part two questions. Agree on this. Seeing what is in writing later can sometimes create an issue. All right. Um, are you aware of a proposed change to the CL waiver that will limit a parent from providing sponsored residential services to their child or adult? Um, I am not aware of that. And um, no, I have not heard of that. If a person's schedule changes, but the outcome does not change, does the entire direct entry need to be revised or can you go in and just revise the schedule? Yeah, you can just revise the schedule. Um, if it doesn't change any of the outcomes and it just affects the schedule, um, like their hours, yeah, you can just revise that for the hours. You, I mean, if it's just the same hours and things are different at a different time of day, you don't need to address adjust the schedule because it's just a sample schedule. It's a general schedule. Things will change throughout the day. But if it affects the hours that for authorization, yes, the schedule needs to change, but you don't need to change the outcome. Are there any plans to review barrier offenses that prevent new hires? Uh, that I can't speak on because that's a um, licensing thing. That's not, or actually, that's not even a licensing thing. That's something that has to happen to the General Assembly. Um, when giving justification for overnight hours, does overnight explanation have to be separate plan or more into the plan where to speak on safety and risk? So the thing with overnight hours, um, it depends on the service, right? So if somebody is sleeping um, through the night, you know, they can't have a skill building service because they're not going to be working on building skills overnight, right? Um, and if somebody needs personal assistance overnight, they wouldn't qualify for companion. Um, and, you know, Medicaid's not going to pay for somebody to sleep, for a supporter to sleep overnight. Um, so you, you need to be able to justify what a person providing support is going to be doing to directly support a person overnight while if they're sleeping or what supervision or supports they're providing. Um, so I can't necessarily give you an explanation on how to, I guess, do that, but you need to be able to provide enough justification. It's not a separate plan, but you need to have that information in there. Michelle, you look like you're about to say something. I was just wondering, Lynn, if, if you could type in, if you're talking about the old, back when we used to have to justify overnight hours in a group home, or are you talking about a particular service? Because there's really no justification for overnight hours in residential anymore because you guys have paid a per diem and it's just a plan. So that would help too. If it's a different service, then that's a different answer. Yeah, what we're seeing a lot now are people um, who need some sort of support overnight in hourly services. Um, I know on my end, you know, requesting in-home uh, for overnight hours, which is not allowable while somebody's sleeping. I'm getting more sleeping. You're right. I just, I know that sometimes I still pop up with that. I still have support coordinators calling me. So it was just, <laughs> it's not happened in a long time, but just making sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Dorcas was answering that question. Um, this week, I did a. So I had a. So this week, I had a support coordinator for Get Residential Day Support off uh, H and S, but we are listed in the key steps. I have been instructed that I would have to wait until the plan starts, enter an interim plan. Although I have it listed in GS. I'm sorry, I don't understand your abbreviations. Um, and shows as the outcome within my part fives. Can I add the missing outcomes? Um, please reach out to your CRC or someone directly for that individualized question. Um, are you able to give a quick explanation on required details for daily notes? 
the vague support instructions were very helpful. Yeah, so for daily notes, <laughs> um, your notes need to, here, actually, let me pull up something that might be helpful. Oh, wait, I cannot minimize Zoom when I'm recording this meeting. Wait. Let's see what I can, let's see what I can offer here. I was gonna pull up the regulation. On note. I have too many windows open. I apologize, everyone. Either requirements. Screen, screen two. I'm not good at making things bigger. I hope you can see this. So this is what the regulations say about daily notes. If you can see this, it says, providers shall prepare and maintain unique person-centered written documentation in the form of progress notes or supports checklists as defined by the service. So defined by your service. So that means um, you need, to go and look at your specific service on whether or not a support checklist is allowable. Um, these shall be in each individual's record about the individual's responses to supports. So you need to have the individual's responses in your daily notes. And specific circumstances that prevented the provision of a scheduled service should that occur. So if you were scheduled to provide service and you weren't able to, you need to have a note saying why. Such documentation should, should be provided to DMAS or its designee upon request. Such documentation shall be written, signed, and dated on the day the sub described supports were provided. So you have to write it that day, sign it that day, and date it that day. Documentation that occurs after the data services were provided shall be dated with the date the documentation was completed and also include the date the services were provided within the date of the note. In instances the individual does not communicate through words, the provider shall, shall note his um, observations about the individual's condition and observable responses, if any, at the time of services. So if they don't use words to speak, if they do use words to speak, use their words. If they don't, use your observations about the person's condition and any observable responses. Things that are not acceptable, standardized or formulaic notes, notes copied from any previous service states and redated, notes that are not signed and dated by staff who deliver the service with the date services are rendered. So you can't have someone else write them, all right? It has to be done by the staff who did it. Person-centered progress notes that do not document the individual's unique opinions or observed responses to supports. So you need to make sure that you have the individual's unique opinions and observed responses in there. Providers shall maintain an attendance log or similar document that indicates the date services were rendered, type of services rendered, and number of hours or units provided, including specific timeframes for services, with a unit of service shorter than one day for each service type, except for one-time services such as assistive technology, environmental modifications, transition services, individual fa family caregiver training, electronic home-based support services, services facilitation, uh, personal emergency response system support services, um, where initial documentation support claims shall suffice. All right, so, those are the things that you need for your notes. Um, so it's pretty clear in there. I, th I think they spell it out very nicely. Have you heard this through any sources? We can track down. Um, as a provider, we've been following DMAS grace period for quarterly review submission date in the past two licensing reviews. We've been told by our Office of Licensing does not 
recognize the grace period and quarterlies need to be completed by the last date of the quarter. Please reg clarify as regulation and interpretation of regulation is different in two oversight departments. Yeah. Hi, Andy. <laughs> um, so yes, um, if they do not line up, you do need to follow the most, this, um, you need to follow the most strict regulation. So um, DMAS grace period, maybe 10 days um, from the end of the quarter. But if licensing does not recognize the grace period, you need to be follow, following the licensing regulation. Um, for peer mentoring services and, uh, but we can actually send that to, uh, Mackenzie had to jump off and she didn't tell me to send her any questions. So we can verify that with licensing in our Q and A document though. Um, but typically if, you know, if they aren't matching up, you need to follow the more stringent policy. Um, for peer mentoring services, can an individual use this while living in a group home? Um, I don't believe that there's anything preventing those two. I don't know. Uh, can one of you on the panel go and double check that those are compatible, but I believe they're compatible. Um, let's see, someone is asking to explain number four. Documentation regarding any restrictions of, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> Here, person-centered progress notes that do not document the individual's unique opinions or observed responses or supports are not acceptable. So you, you need to be including the person's feedback about the supports they're providing uh, or that they're being provided. So whether or not they are, you know, accepting the supports, are they refusing supports? Are they, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say refuse. Are they, are they choosing not to um, uh, participate? in support are they um you know are they are they not happy are they you know are they happy with it you know and why you are why you're making coming to that conclusion is it because they are you saying that with their words is it because they're saying that with their actions and if they're saying that with their actions what describe what they're doing that made you come to that conclusion Right, were they yelling, were they hitting, were they spitting, were they screaming, or were they smiling, were they laughing? Um, you know, what were their, your observed response? What was their response and what were you observing? No, yes, I'm sorry, it's 12 back 30-122-20. Um, it's not possible to create a complete quarterly review until the end of the quarter, so having a quarterly Yes, I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, what is the number of the Virginia code that I'm sharing? Yes, 12 um, 30 122-20. Okay, I think that's all of the questions here. Any other questions? Oh, there's more. Okay, oh, thank you, that's helpful. I'm glad that's helpful. Um, any more? Are aware of any rate changes for the year? Um, no, we did not get a signed budget from the General Assembly. So I don't know of anything else um, because of that. I'm... All right, so if there are no more questions today, I will leave it there. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us. Uh, we enjoy having these meetings with everyone. We had some great presentations today. Um, we will capture these Q and A's um, and the ones we didn't have answers for you. We will hopefully get those out to you soon. And everyone have a great remainder of July. It's not much longer. Summer's gone by fast. All right, take care everyone. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>